uh, and, and this is Brenda Muniz. She's senior advisor for the CFPB's Office of Community Affairs. Uh, uh, she brings many years of financial services experience, both Capitol Hill and her work with the National Council of La Raza. Brenda. Thank you, Tom. Good afternoon, everyone. I, before we start the panel, I wanted to uh, let folks who are watching the live stream and folks in the room know that there will be a recorded version uh, in Spanish that will be provided for consumers on our website in the next few days. So uh, please stay tuned. So this panel is credit reporting issues among LEP Latinos and it follows the two, it follows two other sessions. The first one on the debt collection process and industry practices and then the previous one on debt litigation or debt collection litigation uh, experience of LEP Latinos and some of the uh, methods that uh, debt collectors might use in the court systems. So you may be wondering how is credit reporting related to, to debt collection? Our consumer debts are, our consumer debts and our standing with those debts are rather uh, to what extent we have, uh, what our account status is on those debts and, and whether we are, again, in good standing, whether we've paid them, whether we've paid them on time, is often reflected in our credit report. And what's on our credit report is directly uh, related to our ability to secure and obtain credit. And by obtaining credit, that gives you access to home ownership, to owning a car, uh, to a lot of other things. Not only that, given that credit reports are often used to screen job applicants, to screen potential renters, it is a very, very much a, a big part of our consumer lives. So this session will address topics such as what LEP, LEP Latino consumers, uh, what their access is to their credit reports, are they currently getting their credit reports on a regular basis, what are their options for disputing inaccurate information, and what are some of the potential barriers in the credit reporting marketplace uh, for these consumers. So to shed more light on these topics, we have four very knowledgeable panelists who will offer a, a range of experiences and perspectives. We're gonna do this panel a little bit differently than the previous ones in that each of the panelists is going to provide some opening remarks first, and then at the end we will, uh, yeah, I will pose questions to the panel and foster uh, a discussion. So first we have uh, uh, Sarah Garcia, who is a homeownership counselor and education advisor at NeighborWorks Orange County. To her left is Eric Elman, the Senior Vice President of Public Policy and Legal Affairs with the Consumer Data Industry Association. Then to his left is Araceli Panameño, who is the Director of Latino Affairs at the Center for Responsible Lending. And at the very end is Professor Mary Spector, who is a Professor of Law at the Southern Methodist University Dedman School of Law. And with that, I will turn it over to Sarah. Thank you. Is my mic? Yes, it's on. Well, good afternoon. Um, first and foremost, I, I want to uh, thank the FTC and um, the team for coordinating this roundtable. We see consumers on a daily basis who struggle with something as very basic as when we're pulling credit reports, not knowing how to navigate the system su successfully. And rather than having attained financial be benchmarks, they feel like they're walking several feet backwards um, rather than being able to purchase a home or purchase a car or deny for a job, as just mentioned. And so, um, you know, we have a wish list saying, if only this was in policy, uh, and we are having these conversations, and hopefully our goal is to be able to set policies and procedures in place that could help uh, the uh, limited English population know what to do and be able to ask the, the correct questions to get from point A to point B. When I was invited to speak to the panel uh, to talk on this issue, there was a, a broad 
topics that I really wanted to focus on, but I want to um, share the an my anecdotal or our anecdotal as far as our cohort of counselors that we experience on a daily basis with folks that are coming in and looking to attain the American dream, which is purchasing a home. And uh, what happens is uh, we, the things that we take for granted, unfortunately, like pulling your credit report, and that's one of the topics uh, that I'll be discussing is we don't uh, pull our, our consumers that we're working with don't pull their credit report on a yearly basis. They feel that there's conception that they'll only pull a credit report when they need to make a financial decision such as maybe uh, accessing a small loan, purchasing a car, um, whatever it may be. And so it's just as basic as understanding the importance of pulling a credit report once a year. And we always say set those uh, New Year's resolutions, what is it that you're gonna do? And we always say one of those New Year's resolutions is always pull your credit report, always. It's so important. Um, what we see with folks that do not pull their credit report on a yearly basis is that um, they're discovering that they're a victim of identity theft when they don't pull their credit report on a yearly basis or have a, a huge, huge lapse in between and they're discovering that they have collection items that they thought were paid for uh, from what we see, for example, from medical billing, saying my insurance was covered. And here's an individual who's thinking that they have a pre, uh, excellent credit score, has poor credit score, so now they have to wait. So the issues that we see definitely are identity theft. What is it that they should, that they should do? We've seen consumers that uh, get bombarded by collection agencies and they end up paying the debt because they just want to be able to take it care, taken care of, but they don't realize that's still going to stay in their credit report for seven years. So, you know, it's knowing how to successfully navigate the system to be able to um, know what to do. Also, uh, the lack of credit history, you know, not uh, especially from the first generation where you pay cash and you want to purchase a home, we pull their credit report and there's lack of history, a credit history. And so here's someone that's then trying to establish at least three trade lines and what they're doing is they're going out and going to a department store or uh, going to get to a financial institution to apply for a, a credit card and they're denied. So rather than this individual or individuals trying to boost their credit score, improve their credit score, it's being uh, decrease because they're doing ha they're having hard inquiries. Um, with that is we see that with collections, if someone doesn't pull their credit report as on a yearly basis, is that there's wage uh, excuse me uh, judgments. Um, now collect or we're seeing that folks are now having judgments and they don't know what to do, again, that's holding them back. Or they come to us and saying, we have a garnish wage wagement. What is it that I'm supposed to do when the correct process wasn't, um, wasn't initi initiated correctly? Someone mentioned the panel early where if someone doesn't live in that address and all of a sudden they're having their wages garnished, that's a challenge for families, especially if they have uh, responsibilities. With not understanding the importance of pulling your, your credit uh, report, then we see um, the having the no credit or even bad credit history. When folks are then trying to establish credit, they go and get a vehicle, um, not necessarily that they're going to a traditional car lot, but they're going to a small business, uh, car, a car place, and their interest rate is at 22%. And just recently I've met with a family where they purchased a, a, a gently used vehicle at an interest rate at 22%. So here's a family trying to establish credit, but now they have this burden of debt where it's a 22% interest rate. You know, what, what is it that, that you can do, or you know, if, if they knew what to do from the very beginning to the very end. Um, we have folks that have perhaps bad credit and they're going to um, unethical businesses that, that are preying on folks that are limited in English and they're saying, well, we're gonna help you clean your credit. Pay us X amount of dollars amount and then the business is no longer, um, no longer there. And so folks are paying out money and they're in a far more predicament, uh, far worse predic predicament than they originally were. 
no credit and bad credit uh, to the limited English uh, population, specifically the Latino population, only because I've, um, I, I work and live in Orange County, you see a lot of payday locations. And so what happens is when you are denied credit, you're then more, um, you're, you're opted to go to the payday locations to get credit. So if you are getting a loan from payday locations, again, you see the interest rate that increases. If you do pay it on time, then you're, you're more, um, more likely to come back and use that alternative uh, loan services rather than to a financial institution to be able to establish credit. We see that um, with a, um, just recently we had a, a family that had very limited credit. Uh, they wanted to be able to establish credit and they co-signed and with their son, but now they're again in a far worse predic predicament when you don't understand the purpose of, of how co-signing really affects someone. So here's someone with um, $90,000 worth of debt. So um, in closing, um, you know, really hoping that there's established guidelines, um, streamlining marketing campaigns to be able to create awareness so that way folks know where, what to do, where to go, what to ask, and be able to increase the credit scores to be able to build assets, whether it be launching a business, purchasing a home, and then what I tell folks is, um, you know, what I share is that for every dime, if we had a dime for every folks that, that come, that every individual that comes to us and say, I wish I would have known this information earlier, it's, you know, we tell them, share that information with individuals that you know, especially children, so that way their generation knows what to do and knows how to successfully navigate the credit, the credit industry. Thank you, Sarah. Eric? Great, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for, uh, to the CFPB and the FTC for hosting this workshop today. I'm Eric Elman with the Consumer Data Industry Association, CDIA. We are a trade association, we are the trade association that represents the consumer reporting industry or as credit bureaus as they are uh, more commonly known. And the credit bureau's job is really to help businesses manage their credit risk and ultimately helps consumers uh, achieve their financial goals and to help them achieve uh, some degree of economic opportunity. Uh, this is a valuable workshop that we're having and we're happy to be part of this conversation. This workshop and others that will follow are part of a dialogue to help credit bureaus, consumer reporting agencies, better understand consumer perspectives, to help advocates, policymakers, and enforcement agencies understand the material challenges of providing multilingual services when consumer disclosures are required by law and those disclosures are tied to private rights of action. And we hope uh, that this will help advocates, uh, policymakers, and enforcement agencies better understand how the marketplace serves consumers today. And I want to make three key points, uh, which I'll highlight in a moment and then go into perhaps more detail as we proceed. First, uh, CDIA and its members are committed to serving consumers. Secondly, the risks of liability in providing other language support uh, beyond what we already do under the Fair Credit Reporting Act uh, are so high that we have to be very careful, that we have to have a very careful uh, discussion. Uh, this is a very nuanced issue, so we have to have a very thoughtful uh, discussion about this. And then third, we want to be able to do more to help consumers uh, in consumer education, in financial education, but federal law, specifically the Credit R Repair Organizations Act, CROA, is a significant roadblock that stands in the credit bureau's way of helping consumers. So the first point, uh, how we serve consumers today. Since 2004, hundreds of millions of consumers have seen their credit disclosures, their credit reports. 15 million a year, according to the CFPB, get their credit report uh, through annualcreditreport.com, which is the site that Congress created uh, to allow consumers to come into that site to get their credit reports. Another 26 million annually get their credit report through a direct-to-consumer product offered by one of our members. The, uh, for decades, CDI members through on-site operators and through third-party translation services have provided a language bridge for LEP consumers who call the credit bureau. Our members tell us that LEP individuals often compensate for their limited English proficiency with assistance from friends, family, or advisors. And in fact, this trusted process is baked into the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which gives consumers specifically a right to allow that assistance to occur. Secondly, the risks of liability are so high uh, 
uh, for providing additional services under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Again, it requires a very careful uh, and nuanced discussion. Uh, and a as an example of the complexity of the situation, let's compare, for example, the, CF the FTC and the CFPB. The FTC makes their website available uh, in just Spanish and in English, but the CFPB, I think, has uh, eight distinct languages uh, on their website which they make available. And this is not, uh, and liability is not just uh, uh, a hypothetical situation. In fact, just last month, the National Immigration Law Center filed an, an, a formal administrative complaint against HHS alleging that, that hundreds uh, of thousands, uh, that tens of thousands and perhaps hundreds of thousands of people were kicked off of the Affordable Care Act coverage, ACA coverage, because the HHS provided language support in only Spanish and English and not in Burmese and Lao and Nepali and Indonesian and others. HHS has handled uh, their multilingual needs similarly to the way the credit bureaus are handling, handling them now. Uh, languages, as we know, are quite diverse. Uh, we pride ourselves in, in our diversity in this country. We are, of course, a nation of, of immigrants. But we have to recognize that there are many dozens of LEP populations with which to serve. New York, for example, has 39 LEP populations, California 38. Texas 34, uh, and Alaska, the number one LEP, speaks uh, one of many Native American languages, and in Maine, the number one LEP population is French. Uh, Hawaiian has an official language that is not in English. The same is true with Alaska. So we have to be careful uh, because particularly, for example, uh, there are many languages spoken here in California and elsewhere across the country where the language that's used is not even in traditional uh, English characters. Uh, including Vietnamese, Hindi, and Korean. And there were discussions, of course, about which Spanish is the right Spanish on, on previous panels. That also applies with Arabic. It applies with other Asian languages, Chinese. There's lots of different variations of what Chinese, Chinese is. And then the last point before we get into a more detailed discussion is, uh, is the Credit Repair Organizations Act, or CROA, which st sets up a statutory impediment through creative lawsuits, originally well-intentioned, but now poorly used by, uh, by clever plaintiff's attorneys to prohibit consumer reporting agencies from being able to do more in the way of education. We have testified before Congress about this. We've had discussions with the CFPB and the FTC about this. Uh, and we hope that coming out of this at some point, uh, the FTC and the CFP will CFPB will join with us in supporting Crow reform legislation. Uh, that's the end of my time, and I'm sure we'll have more time to get into all of these. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Brenda. You're all Thank welcome. You. <laughs> Araceli Panameño, I'm the Director of Latino Affairs for the Center for Responsible Lending. Thank you, CFPB. Thank you, FTC, for hosting this uh, very important conversation. And I hope that it can be replicated elsewhere uh, so that we can get uh, a very broad variety of uh, opinions and information about this very important topic. Um, the Center for Responsible Lending has been in uh, existence for 12 years. We are affiliated with a community development financial institution called Center for Community Self-Help. We are based in Durham, North Carolina. That is a financial services institution, by the way. We have uh, credit unions, um, significant footprint here in uh, California with a uh, um, Spanish-speaking community. Uh, we are also licensed to lend in North Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, Washington, D.C., and we also have a federal credit union charter. Um, that just means that uh, there is an arm of our organization that does financial services um, in multiple spaces. The CRL is the policy research side of the organization. Um, I've been with the organization for 10 years, and uh, um, on this particular topic of debt collection, our analysis shows that today, there are 30 million, 30 million, 30 million Americans that are uh, in some sort of collection proceeding. Um, Somebody is after them for uh, a debt uh, in the average of $1,500. And some of them move through different processes. Um, and we've talked about various components um, of that process uh, today. Now we are focusing on the credit reporting aspect um, of this process. I want to tell you a number of stories because uh, I agree with Rigo. Uh, I think that the data and the numbers are significant, but until we bring it down to the ground, 
it, it can be meaningless. So I'll start out with what happened uh, earlier today. Um, I caught a cab from my hotel to this uh, uh, campus. And on my cab ride, the cab driver was, uh, Mec uh, was born Mex in Mexico, so former Mexican citizen, now US citizen, has been in the United States for 27 years. Um, is doing quite well. And I proceeded to inquire. I said, would you allow me to ask you um, a couple of questions? And please stop me if I am prying too much. Um, and so I said, when was the last time that you saw your credit report and why? Silence. And then he said, well, he said, um, when I went to my financial institutions to establish my uh, savings account, um, I will name that financial institution as, uh, um, I gave it, gave it a different name just to protect their uh, privacy. Uh, so this financial institution, I named it Beds No Go Financial Institution. Um, uh, Beds No Go told this consumer that uh, um, they will provide a service of uh, providing him with a credit report on a quarterly basis for a flat fee of $10 a month. And so my jaw dropped. I said, excuse me, you are paying $120 to your banking institution for you to receive your credit report, which is available to you for free. If you have $120 extra, would you pay that to me? I'll be more than happy to give you <laughs> your credit report on a quarterly basis. That was earlier today. I proceeded to tell him that he could access that information for free, and, and he was a little bit astonished, taken aback, and said, I will cancel. I will go to my <laughs> banking institution today and cancel that, make sure that that is canceled. Um, he was led to believe that he needed to do that. That's how he felt. That was the interpretation of the information that he was provided by a very reputable financial institution, one of the top five financial institutions in the country. Um, I will go now to my personal story. Um, the first time that I uh, came across or, or saw my uh, credit report, there were a number of errors in my credit report because in my family, uh, there are three of us whose first name begins with the letter A. And of course, we all share the last name Panameño. So um, one person was born in 1930. Clearly, that wasn't me. Otherwise, I look pretty darn good. <laughs> <laughs> and I am keeping the secret. Um, the other person is a male. And so unless I've gone a sex exchange operation, that person is not me. Um, and it was very difficult almost an insurmountable. Um, Allison in an earlier panel said that credit reporting issues to have them resolved, she tells her clients this is a marathon, not a sprint. I had to literally do yoga and get myself into a zen before I made my phone calls to the credit reporting agencies in order to resolve the issues where I had to prove who I was in order to have the errors corrected. Um, and then my final story is uh, clearly credit reporting and the data within it is so important. It not only impacts my access to credit, it also impacts many other things, my employability. Uh, the last time I applied for a job, the job I currently hold, I am not a bank teller. I do not handle money. Um, but my employer had to do a credit report check. Um, and I was told by Human Resources that uh, pending my credit report check and other checks uh, that they were going to do that, they will notify me whether or not an offer could be made. I guess I passed. I've been here for 10 years. Um, and then finally, my um, auto insurance uh, company. I pulled my record, by the way, just to prepare myself for this conversation. Um, and I noticed that my auto insurance company pulled my credit record earlier this year to actually make a determination as to whether or not my insurance needed to go up. Uh, notice they won't give me discount for having a good credit record. <laughs> 
So I'll stop there. Um, I'll be more than happy to talk about three different components within this area on the uh, next segment of our conversation, which has, to, has got to do with debt collection, debt buying, and debt settlement. Thank you. Thank you, Araceli. Professor Spector? Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to the CFPB and to the FTC for inviting me to participate. I teach in a law school clinic and at the SMU Dedman School of Law in Dallas, Texas. We've represented limited English proficiency clients for years, um, Latinos and others, in a range of cases, landlord-tenant cases, um, home sales, car repairs, car buying, um, and just plain debt defense cases like the kinds we've heard about today. In fact, one of the first debt buyer cases we had several years ago was a Latino man who claimed he was being sued for a debt that wasn't his. Regardless of the type of case um, in, which we're on, in which we're involved, inevitably, the question from the client is, how is this going to affect my credit? How's it going to affect my credit report? What happens if we file the suit? What happens if I settle? What happens if I do nothing? How is that going to affect my credit? For our clients, for many of our clients, the credit report is like their resume. With that credit report is what they use to get a job, what they use to get an apartment, what they use to get their insurance. It is their resume and it is extremely important to them. And it's because it's important to them that we started a credit reporting project a couple of years ago. And it has three main parts. One is outreach and education. And so the students and I, the students are student attorneys that are licensed under our state bar to, in, to act as student attorneys in Texas. We've collaborated with United Way agencies, um, the ones that are responsible for implementing the VITA, the Volunteer Income Tax um, assistance program. We can reach large numbers of people by partnering with this organization. And what we've done is we have a little mobile office. Thank you, FTC. We've used your brochures in Spanish and English. We bring our laptops, we bring um, portable printers, we bring a mobile hotspot, and we sit down and we offer consumers information about credit reporting. We also, the student attorneys, go on a one-on-one, -on -one, providing direct assistance to the consumers, pulling a credit report using the mobile hotspot, annualcreditreport.com, when we can pull the report. Um, and then the students review the report with the consumer, identifying problems if there are areas of dispute, um, answering questions, and giving advice. The third part of the project is research, and we're collecting our own data in a very small way. We have the students work, um, gather information on a survey about the information that they're finding on the credit report, about the accuracy, about the kinds of loans. Um, and what we've learned um, is that the information from this project is that there are, again, three areas of primary concern. Um, one, and it, it's not just LEP Latinos, it's most of our clients, and that is a general lack of understanding of the basic features of the credit transaction and the credit reporting process. A, a perfect example, and this happened a couple of times in the last, um, last go-round of the project, is that a consumer sees a collection account on their credit report for an auto loan. Well, that auto loan shouldn't be there. I gave them back the car. <laughs> Obviously, the person didn't understand what the credit transaction. And it's from experiences like those that we've, um, we've learned that, um, particularly with LEP consumers, um, starting with credit reporting is like throwing someone in the deep end, right? We're throwing them in the deep end and expecting them to swim. We really have to start in the shallow end and pro provide much more basic information about the credit transactions. We've tried that a little bit with a group that we work with that um, provides adult 
language classes to immigrants from all over the world. We, we started to provide a little, a little session on credit reporting. Well, we did that once. The second session was what is credit? So we're, we're hoping we're learning that lesson. Um, the second thing, and, and I really don't want to spend too much time on this, but it was something that was mentioned earlier, is that credit in the, in the Latino community can really be sort of a family affair. That family members can be generous with personal information and allow other members of their family to use it to open an account, a cell phone or something like that. But when the cousin doesn't pay the cell phone bill and gives the cell phone back, um, the account ends up on the uncle's or the cousin's credit report and not understanding how those transactions work can be, um, is something that we work with. The next thing that we've learned is access is important. Many of our consumers um, were unable to access their credit reports at all. Um, fully a third of the people we saw in the last iteration of our project. Um, annualcreditreport.com, which is free, is not available in Spanish. Um, and then the security questions are pretty hard to understand, even for someone who is proficient in English, like me. One of the questions I think is really a trick. It asks um, to identify the state which issued your social security number. State issuing social security numbers? I thought that was the Social Security Administration. Um, so it's hard. Access is a real problem. And in the end, that may be um, one of the biggest hurdles we have. We asked a question, how easy or hard did you think the credit reporting, this process was? And um, no one said it was simple. 60% it was difficult, very difficult, or somewhat difficult. And they had someone sitting there with them. The, last, um, the next area involves na names, and, and um, we touched on, you touched on that, Araceli. Um, another factor that, it, that comes up with names are changes in spelling, an S versus a Z. Um, there's a case out of the Third Circuit, Sandra Cortez versus TransUnion. Um, she was a Z. The Sandra Cortez that was an S was on a government watch list. Uh, it was really hard for her to buy a car. Um, <laughs> the, but the other thing with names is a practice common among many Latinos is the use of two last names, two surnames. Um, and this is something that the CDIA might be interested in. In Latino, com in Latino communities, the two last names appear in one order. I believe it is that the um, father's name comes second, and the husband's name comes third. So if I'm, if I'm Mary Spector, that's my maiden name, um, I'm Mary Spector Black in, t in Texas, but I'm Mary Black Spector in Mexico, and that's hard, and so it results in many mixed, um, mixed files. Um, finally, and this is where I think um, people can do um, a lot of good, is that, um, and it's something that's been touched on earlier, that many of our, um, the L LEP Latinos um, aren't, um, aren't only, they're not only not knowledgeable about their rights, but they're reluctant to assert them. Um, that's particularly hard when you're at, when the statutory frameworks are designed for self-help. The FDCPA, wants people to ask for validation of the debt. Well, if you're reluctant to ask your, assert your rights, that system is gonna break down. The same is true with the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which, re, which has a system for disputes, and the CDIA has an automated system, but in a community that is reluctant to assert its rights, those systems don't mean a whole lot. Um, we're still analyzing some of the material that we've, um, that we've got um, and I'll be glad to share when I do. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all the panelists for their opening remarks. Many of you in some way or another touched on, on sort of access to credit reports and whether or not uh, Latino consumers, in particular LEP consumers, requested them frequently or knew that they were entitled to a free credit report. 
um, on a yearly basis. Um, I mean, do you find that this particular community has less access to their credit reports or is less likely to request their credit report? And if so, what can be done about it? I'll start with Sarah. I, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, first and foremost, specifically for first generation folks, uh, not being able to successfully navigate a, a computer, um, you know, they, they, they would rather rely on the creditor to be able to pull their credit report because they're not comfortable utilizing um, a computer. But two, there's a lot of commercials with freecreditreport.com mm -hmm. and they market a lot. And the irony is that it's not free and you have freecreditreport.com and I believe that the last time that I had read the statistics, it was 7% of consumers actually utilize annualcreditreport.com. So you have this huge disparity um, so, you know, again, uh, um, streamlining some type of, of marketing um, campaign to be able to promote annualcreditreport.com where it is, you know, user friendly. Um, you access your three, three reports from the, the three credit bureaus. But, you know, those are some of the challenges that, that we see. Right. What about you, Eric? I mean, given that, uh, have you seen a difference in different populations? How are they more willing or more likely to access their credit report? Well, uh, let me respond a couple of ways. First of all, uh, we don't, in fact, can't uh, keep credit reports that contain information about mm -hmm. ethnic status, national origin, creed, color, religion, et cetera. So we don't really have any, any data. But I, I think what your question and some of the points raised uh, raise a couple of good questions about how consumers find information. Uh, I mentioned since 2004, uh, hundreds of millions of consumers have seen copies of their credit reports, but still a third or more of consumers have never once seen a credit report, and that's a problem. And we think that everybody should be able to exercise their free rights under mm -hmm. annualcreditreport.com to get one free report per year from each credit bureau. Uh, and our members offer a lot of credit education services, which uh, the Credit Repair Organizations Act was very well intentioned. We supported it then. Uh, we support it today, but changes have to be made to allow us to interact better mm -hmm. in providing more information to consumers. Uh, and, and, and on the point of, uh, of credit clinics, and as, as some of these late night commercials where you say no credit, bad credit, credit, no problem, <laughs> um, perhaps that's where your taxi driver went, uh, <laughs> but this is a problem. In fact, the Credit Repair Organizations Act was designed specifically to address those kinds of problems. What credit clinics do is they take uh, consumers' hard-earned good money and do things for consumers that either they could do free for themselves or uh, they promise to do things that are violations of state or federal law or both. And what they do oftentimes is they, uh, is they repeatedly uh, contact credit bureaus attempting to erase uh, accurate but adverse information and their goal is, is to essentially pound the credit bureaus into submission. Um, but, and that is not what CROA was all about. Uh, so it, it's a very complicated answer, but mm -hmm. essentially I think uh, a lot is being done, but uh, more needs to be done. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Ayaseli and, and Professor Spector, you had mentioned uh, I guess some problems with annualcreditreport.com. So how can that be made more accessible to, to folks who, who might not, or English might not be their first language or they don't feel as comfortable um, doing business or, or requesting their credit report in, in English? So language has already been identified as uh, uh, one of the barriers. Um, Mary Spector mentioned the difficulty of the questions. Um, I have multiple college degrees. Um, I have visited uh, the website for annualcreditreport.com multiple times since uh, it became law for me to access my credit report uh, free. And yes, some of those questions, I have a sense that they are tricky. They, they are sort of like LSAT type of questions. <laughs> so they're not entirely uh, wrong, but you have to choose the most right answer. <laughs> you make me feel better. <laughs> um, so the level of difficulty in terms of trying to prove, and, and I do see, by the way, Eric, I do see the sensitivity of the information that is about to be disclosed to me, 
And so I know that I must provide information that uh, it's reliable in terms of uh, invalid, in terms of my actually getting to the information that I am seeking. I do give value to that. Um, but I do think that uh, uh, it can be made simpler. Um, also, I have to mention that I have looked at credit reports by the different three bureaus. Uh, they have different formats. Um, they are somewhat consistent in terms of providing a summary, um, uh, but they have different formats and different ways of actually presenting uh, somewhat similar information that can be confusing to the consumer. Um, I also want to mention that the three major credit bureaus are not the entirety of data aggregators in the marketplace. So when it comes to access to credit and activity and information that impacts consumers' ability to access, um, that data is being collected in more places than just the credit bureaus. So you can breathe easy perhaps. There is an organization uh -huh. called LexisNexis that is a data aggregator. Um, there is a movement called Big Data. Uh, social networking sites are now being tapped into, by the way, to actually determine uh, what your postings are on Facebook, on uh, uh, Pinterest, on uh, Twitter. The type of information that a consumer is posting on some of those social networking sites can also be used to make a determination as to whether or not you are worthy of credit. Um, and it reflects on your credit worthiness. So those are some of the issues as well that uh, uh, are impacting consumers. Uh, I'm gonna follow up on one or two of those comments. One, well, one, obviously the language issue. Um, the, in talking with some of my students preparing for today, one of them recalled that they had to call the, the credit bureau because they couldn't use the site. They were, I don't remember which of the agencies it was. And they were very happy there was someone there who could speak Spanish. What the student reported to me though was he didn't think the person would have made the call had he not been there sitting with them. So there has to be something to make the information more accessible. About the level of difficulty of the questions, uh, the students, as we were going through this process, realized that they weren't able to pull up credit reports. And like me, they thought the credits were hard. The <laughs> questions were hard. Questions like, um, who is your mortgage loan provider? Well, does that mean the bank that you went to take out the loan, or does that mean your servicer where you make the payments? Um, what is your, you know, questions like that. So what we did in working with um, one of the agencies, the language school, the learning center, was to, we started tracking um, the questions that were asked and, and put together a little form that we could give consumers to let them know that when they were pulling a credit report, this is the kind of information they want, might want to have to be able to access the site. And that, um, and that was something that made it a little easier. But of the three different bureaus, I think there were uh, uh, nearly 30 different security questions and they're in a random fashion. Mm -hmm. So that's hard. And that somehow mm -hmm. needs to be, um, whether it's plain language or something that makes it more accessible while still protecting the information that's about to be pulled from the credit report. Can I make a point here? Sure. Um, on these, what we call challenge questions, when you go to annualcreditreport.com or acr.com, you are asked um, questions that are not insurmountable, but they are deliberately difficult. You are, answer, you are asked what we call out of wallet questions. So for example, if I leave my wallet sitting here and someone else picks it up, we ask you questions that no one who picks this up will be able to answer, like in what state was your social security number issued, or who is your mortgage loan servicer, and you don't, uh, and, and you get a number of, of multiple choice questions, but here's why it's deliberately difficult. We are all terribly aware and terribly concerned about the prospect of identity theft. And we want to make sure that you are the absolute one and only person who should be getting a copy of that credit report. And, uh, and if somebody else gets it, it's gonna be a significant problem. A credit report is an extraordinarily valuable 
uh, document for a consumer or for a fee. Uh, it is a credit report. A credit report essentially is your advocate uh, in a, we are long past the days where consumers know who their bankers are and the bankers know who their consumers are. So all we have essentially is our credit report. Um, and so, so it's important that we ask these difficult questions to prevent, uh, to prevent that from happening. And then lastly, um, uh, if you are denied a copy of your credit report from annualcreditreport.com because you can't answer these questions, you are given opportunities on the website to call. You're given a toll-free number. You're given a, a way to write in. Um, and it is a hassle and it is an inconvenience, yes. But the liability to the credit bureaus for giving the, wrong, the right credit report to the wrong person are unbelievably astounding. So we have to be very, very careful. Great. Thank you. So we talked a little bit about accessing our, accessing our free credit reports. Um, also uh, wanted to talk about what do you do once you do have your credit report and you believe that there is inaccurate information that's included. Do, based on your experience, do you think that uh, limited English proficient Latinos dispute more regularly, less regularly? Are their disputes unique in some way? Um, I think Araceli, you were gonna, you said that uh, CRL had done some, I think, research into this. Um, so not CRL, um, not, I, in preparation for this uh, um, session, decided to pull a listserv that I keep personally of 500 Latino um, friends at different levels of uh, uh, social strata. And I posed a number of questions asking these questions. Uh, when asked how many of them had accessed their credit report within the last year, out of 500, one person had. Out of 500, one person had. In terms of uh, whether or not they were more likely to complain in my little universe of 500, and this is from across the country, um, nobody was, uh, uh, had admitted to actually filing a complaint, even if they had found discrepancies um, within their report, if they had seen the report, but only one person had seen the report, other people reported being denied credit, um, and they actually had a sense that it was their fault. Um, they were least likely to complain because they didn't have time, because they didn't have resources, because they could not hire an attorney. They believed that um, a service provider was in a higher level of authority that they couldn't question, and therefore the higher level of authority would be um, adhering to ethical behavior. Those were assumptions. Um, and so they expected the system to work better here in the United States than in their country of origin. Right. And Sarah, since you deal with clients on the ground and face to face, is there any assistance that you're aware of that that reaches this particular community as far as helping them resolve yes. um, what they think are discrepancies or errors? There's definitely, again, uh, we see this more for first generation folks where, uh, first generation where, you know, if it's a small debt, uh, we see a lot of medical debt that, that shows up. Uh, it's a collection and, for some reason, consumers feel that it, it, they are responsible for it. For some reason, it's listed in there. They, you know, a spouse, um, or at some point in time, if they now have adult children, that years back they went for some type of service, and they'll end up paying the debt just to to get it removed. However, when we see that it's progressed to a judgment, or now they're being serviced uh, through their HR to garnish their wages. We do, we collaborate with the Legal Aid Society of Orange County. Uh, there's uh, folks that the ch right channels are not followed and so folks do not know what to do. Um, but we find that they, folks, if they're not pulling a credit report, one, mm -hmm. they wouldn't know, two, they wouldn't feel comfortable in calling and complaining or saying what is it that we can do because they wouldn't, some don't know where to start, um, mm -hmm. and the language is probably the biggest challenge is, right. is there someone that's gonna speak Spanish for me, mm -hmm. uh, or that's gonna assist me? I call the collection, the, the, the folks will call the original creditor, and the original creditor is saying, it's you know it's not us, you need to call the, the, the collection agency, and they haven't received communication from the collection agency. There's definite, definitely still uh, trials and tribulations mm -hmm. um, in this area, 
not knowing what to do. Um, but if you, you know, we, we really do have a, a great relationship with the Legal Aid Society of Orange County where they'll provide the, the steps and to uh, have folks empower themselves through other resources so that way they would know um, what to do. It's interesting because you mentioned medical debt and in our first presentation by Marisa Valtorres from NCLR, she had mentioned a DEMO study that said that medical debt was the largest source of debt for, for uh, Latino consumers. And FICO recently announced that they would uh, basically you know, differentiate between medical debt and other kinds of debt. Um, is this a proposal that you all have thought about? Do you think it's a good idea, bad idea? Eric, do you want to take the first stab at that? Well, <laughs> I know that, 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 that FICO has made some uh, changes based upon uh, medical debt, and, and I believe Vantage Score may have also, but uh, I think what's important to consider is that this is still not a, a settled question in that we have to decide uh, collectively, individually, the value of medical debt as predictive risk. Lenders who are uh, lending several hundred thousand dollars for a home uh, or 10, 15, 20, 30 thousand dollars for a car, uh, they have to make sure that they are making the best uh, educated guess possible as to whether this loan is gonna be paid back. And medical debt is still debt. And uh, it is a liability that a consumer has in addition to all his or her other liability. So I think uh, before we start uh, making these great sounding public policy pronouncements about medical debt, I think we have to take a very more, a very deeper, a, a deeper dive, more careful look into uh, how is this changing uh, predictive risk for lenders. There are other types of transactions in the live of lives of consumers that do not get taken into account uh, when determining either what goes into your credit report or what is calculated into your credit score. For example, rent payments. Um, rent payments do not get, you don't get credit. It doesn't matter whether or not you are a good rent payer, whether you pay on time, it does not matter. It does not matter uh, in terms of whether or not you pay your, your utility bills on time or not. Uh, most often, uh, telecom or uh, landlords will report negative activity on you, but they will not do full reporting. So that is problematic. Um, if, an, if an organization is only reporting that you are late, clearly that is impacting your credit record in a negative way, but they are not reporting your positive and good behavior, so you don't get the benefit of that. There have been studies done by the Urban Institute in the past where if you actually took into consideration rent payment on time, it lifts credit scores by 10%. It is to the greater benefit of Latinos and African Americans that have been suffering the greatest in terms of being targets of predatory lending across the board. Uh, the latest issue I'm working on is auto lending. Um, last year, at the end of the year, Ally was uh, uh, found uh, to have arrived at a settlement with the CFPB and the Department of Justice for having discriminated against Latinos first, uh, African Americans second, and Asian Pacific Islanders. Out of 235 consumers in that particular case, 125,000 um, were Latino, 100,000, we're African American and 10,000, we're Asian Pacific Islanders. So clearly, we are receiving the brunt of predatory activity, um, but we don't get the benefit when we actually do good behavior, whether it is uh, payment of rent on time or payment of utilities on time. Uh, payday loans is an issue also that impacts uh, negatively to consumers, and it causes uh, uh, bank accounts to be closed, people to go into foreclosure, having to actually uh, request from the state assistance because uh, it's leading you in a downward path in terms of your credit life. Okay. Mr. Schechter, do you have a I, I have something. I probably stand somewhere in between the mm -hmm. two of you mm -hmm. on, um, um, in, on the scope of information that is reported. It's true that there is good information that's not reported. Um, I worry, though, about over-inclusion in credit reporting. 
um, for a number of reasons. One is for some consumers, no credit is better than bad credit. Um, and the fact that the credit report is like the resume, the bad credit can, a bad credit report can be very har harmful. So that's number one. Um, number two is, and this goes to the education issue, in making um, a lender making a decision about lending money for a home, for, an, for a car, we, all, we have another body of law, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act. And it has a provision that if a consumer asks, the lender is supposed to be a, is supposed to look at things like rent payment and utility. So it's up to the consumer again to assert the consumer's right to ask the lender to look at the information. Um, it'd be nice to flip it around um, when the when the creditor or the lender in making the decision says, "Well, your credit score isn't great. What else can I look at?" That would be really nice. Um, and I think that there are some institutions that are, are experimenting with that with some positive results. Um, on the issue of medical debt, um, medical debt, unlike other kinds of debt, is generally involuntary. It's there because someone got sick, they got hurt, they were in an accident, and they receive services from a doctor or a hospital and it ends up on their, on their credit report. Often, they don't even know there's a collection account until they pull their credit report. And so, I, I, as I understand it, I, th that's one of the reasons that FICO has made a decision it has, and there have been some efforts to um, challenge, you know, put limits on the way medical debt is reported, if it's going to re be reported, sort of limiting um, the length of time it appears on a report, and that which may strike a balance between the two. Thank you. Can I, can I so, add one, one sure. point? Uh, RSLE made uh, an important point which I, I think needs to be amplified, and that's the, the value and importance of what we call alternative data. Uh, for many consumers, particularly in the LEP com community, who don't have traditional credit like mortgages or car loans or credit cards, all they ha might have is utility payments and cell phone payments and, and rent payments and things like that. Uh, our members are working very hard uh, with uh, with organizations like the uh, Center for Responsible Lending and others to increase the amount of alternative data that comes into consumer reporting agencies so consumers can get the credit that they deserve. Great. But let me say, Center for Responsible Lending has not necessarily said that uh, uh, this ought to be good. We think that we need to study it further uh, because of the issues that have, raised, have been raised here. However, what I was pointing out to is that uh, alternatives uh, service providers are willing to provide negative reporting to the credit bureaus and they do not provide positive reporting. Okay. It's just a statement of fact. I think but Mr. Elman and I could probably talk all afternoon on that <laughs> <subject>. <laughs> So, We're unfortunately we don't have all afternoon. We have like, I think, one more minute. So, in, um, I'll, just have, I'll just ask one last question to the panel, and in 30 seconds or less, um, what changes in the credit reporting marketplace do you think should occur in order to improve the experience, especially for, for English language learners uh, in the Latino community with respect to either accessing your credit report or disputing um, what you perceive to be errors on your credit report? And I'll start uh, with Professor Spector, and then we'll work our way back. Uh, make the dispute process easier. Uh, that would be my, that's less than 30 yeah, seconds. Yeah, that is. Yeah. <laughs> Make it easier and more certain so that when a person disputes something, they get an answer and, um, and it stays answered or challenged. Okay. So, so language access is important, but I would also add that in the affirmative, undocumented status, issues do not trump consumer rights. So it doesn't matter what your legal status is, you still have consumer rights in the marketplace. And those need to be uh, promoted and, and people need to be made aware of them. Uh, um, more consumers need to check their credit reports regularly, at, at least annually. Uh, and the Credit Repair Organizations Act needs to be reformed. Very quickly. Uh, you know, if I had a wish list, and my the cohort of counselors agree with me, is for folks that have um, no credit or bad credit, and when they're utilizing payday locations, that the uh, payday locations to establish some type of policy to report to the bureau, so that could then 
report um, a way of establishing credit. Okay, great. Well, I want to thank all of the panelists for being here and engaging in a robust discussion around a complicated set of issues, and uh, let's give them an applause. Thank you.